perpetual light shines from an upstairs window in Arasa Nukturan, the official residence of Ireland's president that is located in Dublin's Phoenix Park. The light is a symbolic beacon, reaching out to welcome Ireland's emigrant families and their descendants back to their ancestral homeland. President Mary Robinson, who first popularized the notion of an Irish diaspora, introduced this tradition of the light in 1990. She understood that millions of Irish, whether born in Ireland, exiled from it, or born elsewhere of Irish ancestry, felt a deep and abiding tie to the country. As many as 70 million people worldwide claim Irish descent. This year, in the absence of gathering on Fifth Avenue, we salute each other virtually as we celebrate a new milestone, 260 years of the New York St. Patrick's Day Parade. History loves a parade because history is a parade that never stops. It flows, it streams, it rushes forward. The Irish journey in North America began before the nation's founding and has witnessed a series of milestones that helped shape the country's success through the years. Each year, the hopes and dreams of the Irish are enacted in a vivid celebration of the nation's longest running parade and the people and events that shaped it. The annual parade reflects their strength and spirit and is an integral part of New York City life. This year's parade is a salute to our shared history and its heroes. We honor the troops in colonial times and those in the Civil War before moving to the first responders of 9-11 and those on the front lines of the pandemic today. The Long Green Line gallantly marched by the descendants of the seven million who emigrated over the past three centuries, is a vivid portrait of the triumphs of a proud and passionate people. The first organized observance of St. Patrick's Day was in 1737, when the Charitable Irish Society of Boston gathered in honor of their patron saint in that city. Then, in 1762, a dinner was hosted in the New York home of John Marshall, an Irish Protestant. The first recorded parade in New York was by Irish soldiers in the British Army in 1766. This first milestone was followed in the brutal winter of 1779 to 1780. General George Washington knew he had a morale problem on his hands with a freezing ragtag army threatening mutiny. The general's decision to announce a holiday for the troops, their only day off that winter, was a pragmatic one. A little merriment could go a long way, Washington thought. So on March 16, 1780, General Washington penned an order. The general congratulates the army on the very interesting proceedings of the Parliament of Ireland and the inhabitants of that country, which have been lately communicated, not only as they appear calculated to remove those heavy and tyrannical oppressions on their trade, but to restore to a brave and generous people their ancient rights and freedom, and by their operations to promote the cause of America. Desirous of impressing upon the minds of the army transactions so important in their nature, the general directs that all fatigue and working parties cease for tomorrow the 17th, a day held in particular regard by the people of the nation. Ever the Commander-in-Chief, Washington set limits on the day's jollification, ordering that the celebration of the day will not be attended with the least rioting or disorder, and that the officers were to stay in their own quarters, with troops remaining within their encampments. There are no records of any bad behavior fallout from this holiday, so the general's wishes were likely heeded. Who were those Irish troops? 
led by General Washington in colonial America. Well, in 1762, if we try to imagine ourselves back in 1762, we're at the closing stages of the French and Indian Wars. And there are reports that in that first St. Patrick's Day parade, we hear the sound of fifes and drums. I think that's a hint that amongst the parade were several of those who might be described today as Ulster Scots. They're with Irish Catholics and that many members of the British Army, the rank and file, had been born in Ireland, many of them in the north and many of them Ulster Presbyterians. So we see this influence of the British military then uh, on the continent of North America in that early parade. Why were they there, we might ask ourselves. Only a decade later in Ireland, they joined the Irish Volunteers and they did it with huge enthusiasm. Ulster Presbyterians in the Irish Volunteers. Well, I believe they did it because they loved uniforms, they loved flags, they loved music, and they loved parades. They also loved toasting, and they loved socializing. It might not accord with the kind of stereotype we have in our heads today of an Ulster Presbyterian, but the people of the 18th century were much rougher and readier than the images that we sometimes dream of sober, um, Presbyterians in the 19th century. They were a different kind of people. One year later, in 1763, at the end of the war, the Treaty of Paris ceded huge territories to the British. And the British Crown had a problem. It needed what we might call bio. It needed people. It needed people who would settle in the huge interior of the North American continent and hold that land and protect its frontiers. Ulster Presbyterians responded uh, very enthusiastically. Perhaps two thirds of the flow from Ireland in the 1760s and 1770s derived from Ulster and was made up principally of those Presbyterians. One of those emigrants that perhaps stands out as a kind of iconic uh, emigrant representing the Ulster Presbyterians who crossed the Atlantic was a man called John Dunlap. We today probably, if we know that name, will know John Dunlap as the man who printed some of the earliest editions of the Declaration of Independence. He was born uh, in the town of Straban in County Tyrone, not far from where I am today. Uh, and 10 years later in 1757, as a boy of 10, he joined his uncle who was a printer in Philadelphia and started his apprenticeship in printing. As I said, they were commercial people and Dunlop proved, Dunlap proved to be a really shrewd able businessman. He made significant money during the American Revolutionary War um, from printing and he made even more money uh, subsequently through land speculation. Perhaps not unlike a certain stereotype of migrants from Ireland irrespective of their background, he invested much of that money towards the end of his life in the whiskey bottle but perhaps we'll move on from there. In 1785 um, he wrote back to Straban, wrote home to his brother, uh, Robert. And in that uh, letter, he gives us a wonderful, um, a, a wonderful section that I'm going to read to you. Um, he wrote this to Robert. He said, the young men of Ireland who wish to be free and happy should leave it and come here as quick as possible. There's no place in the world where a man meets so rich a reward for good conduct and industry as America. And that's such a wonderful ringing endorsement of the new world of America. It gives us that notion of opportunity seeking and of living out your ambitions in the new world. And I think that rings true also that it's a wonderful piece of writing. He writes beautifully, which reminds us that these Presbyterians were a very literate people. And we know that they were a very literate people. They read their Bibles. Later, they would go on to read the works of um, Burns. And they, they loved education and they valued the, the values of the Scottish Enlightenment. At the end of the Revolutionary War, of course, America won its independence. And so much of that new excitement and energy that was associated with the new republic was again conveyed back across the Atlantic. America developed right across the whole island and every sect the idea and notion of the American dream 
that would be so important when we came to the period of the 1840s and the change in the profile of migrants from the island of Ireland and the influx of large numbers of poor refugees escaping famine in Ireland. And in many ways, as the later 19th century progressed, that tended to form a reaction amongst the American Irish Protestants who wanted to differentiate themselves, wanted to develop a narrative which they saw as distinctively different. But in fact, I think if we look back, there was so much that they shared in common and that that is a hope maybe that our, the island of Ireland can draw in uh, as we move forward and America of commonality. There's so much which we all share and that ultimately we're stronger together. In the 1820s, American newspapers began covering the St. Patrick's Day Parade as an event filled with celebrations and neighborhood parties held mostly in New York's Roman Catholic communities. At the time, the Irish were still the target of prejudice and ill feeling from New York's Protestant elitists. The first Grand Marshal was selected in 1843, and in 1851, that became a tradition. Over time, the main parade has marched on Fifth Avenue, and the ancient order of Hibernians, the AOH, organized and managed it. The second key milestone on Ireland's journey in North America was the migration spurred by the Great Hunger and Gorta Moor. Thousands of refugees flooded America's cities. These immigrants increased the Irish presence and changed the urban landscape. The famine was a period of mass starvation and disease in Ireland that lasted from 1845 to 1852. It devastated the country. This was a watershed moment in the history of Ireland, which at the time was part of the United Kingdom and ruled directly by Westminster from 1801 to 1922. The Great Hunger and its effects spurred a century-long population decline that permanently changed the country and its people, politics, and culture. The famine caused an estimated one million deaths and two million refugees fled to seek safe harbor elsewhere. Hello, my name is Gabriel Bourne. When Great Britain brought Ireland under its rule in 1801, it was a small addition to Britain's extensive network of colonies, all linked by lucrative trade routes and defended by the powerful British army. For most of the 19th century, in fact, Great Britain was the largest and richest empire in history. Ireland, with its farmland and labourers, was expected to provide grains, butter, livestock, and other commodities to its British rulers. Yet, at the same time, about half the population of Ireland was so poor that they survived entirely on the potato. It was a dangerous dependence on only one crop, but they had little choice. By 1800, very few Irish people owned land. Most were tenants of Anglo-Irish landowners, but they survived because the potato is so nourishing that a small plot of land could provide almost a year's worth of food for a family while they labored for the landlord to pay the rent. On Gorta Moor, the Great Hunger began in Ireland in 1845 and continued more than seven years. But it wasn't just a period of tragic starvation brought about when a new and virulent fungus struck the potato plant. The stage for this intense crisis had been set over several hundred years. At the core was the land in Ireland and the changing laws that governed it. Uh, perhaps we could start by thinking of Ireland in 1845 before the disaster of the Great Hunger struck Ireland. 
And at that stage, the population of Ireland was about eight and a half million people. It had grown very quickly since 1800. It was one of the fastest growing populations in Europe. And Irish people, contrary to perhaps um, contemporary thought, were very tall. And they were tall because they had a very nutritious diet. The combination of potatoes and buttermilk, in fact, gave Irish people every nutrient and vitamin that they needed to be healthy. So Irish people before the Great Hunger were tall, were healthy. And the other thing to think about Ireland at this time was it was a country that was producing an agricultural surplus. Every year before 1845, Ireland exported enough grain, barley, wheat, oats to Britain to feed two million people. So although there were vulnerabilities in the Irish economy and certainly people at the bottom of the social scale were very poor, Ireland was not a country where famine on that scale seemed inevitable. Unfortunately, as we know, blight appeared on the potato crop in 1845. It destroyed about 30% of the crop. And that wasn't unusual. People could cope. They would pour what they had. They would sell it, what they had. They might slaughter their little pigs. They would share what they had in the expectation that the following year, the potato crop would be good. That was what usually happened. Unfortunately, that didn't happen in the 1840s. The blight returned in varying degrees for six more years. So Ireland underwent seven years of shortages and people died and people emigrated. And what happened changed Ireland forever. What is really interesting to me is that when I was a student in Trinity College in the 1980s, the famine was not really talked about. There was very little literature about the famine. There were really just two scholarly books, very different opinions. Uh, the famine was not taught in schools and there were no university courses that discussed the famine. Yet, even though scholars had not paid too much attention to, to this topic, it was something everybody had an awareness. Both Irish people in Ireland and the Irish diaspora there was an awareness that this was something that had really shaped them as a people. And a change really came in 1995, which was the 150th anniversary of the first appearance of Blight. And suddenly there was a lot of interest, both scholarly and popular interest. And in the intervening almost 30 years now, that interest hasn't waned and it seems to be growing. And the famine is being represented and understood in so many different ways that are really exciting. So it's not just historians who are interested in the topic of the famine. Human rights activists, of course, um, artists, uh, Declan O'Rourke, the musician. There's an opera based on Azenath Nicholson. There's artwork, of course, the Quinnipiac University has the Famine Museum opened by President John Leahy. So we have different ways of understanding the famine and different scholarly ways, different methodologies of approaching it. And one particularly exciting way is epigenetics, which looks at the DNA of people, of survivors of the famine. And this relates to our Irish famine, but any famine. We know that if people undergo sustained trauma and malnutrition, it becomes transgenerational. And based on the work of Una Walsh, we know that it lasts for five generations. So people like myself, I'm still that fifth generation. So in many ways, I feel myself to be a child of the famine, even though you know, I grew up in relatively affluent circumstances. The famine is literally there as part of our DNA. But what I think the famine also does and what learning about the Irish famine does is it teaches us an awareness of contemporary issues relating to hunger and famine. We talk about food security today, and especially in the light of the COVID crisis, we know food security is an issue that is actually becoming more and more important. You know, people are hungry in the world today. There is famine in parts of the world today. And I remember a few years ago when Mary Robinson was president of Ireland and she visited Somalia which at that stage was famine torn. And she talked about Irish people having an informed consciousness. And I really believe that we as Irish people, as descendants of famine survivors have an informed consciousness that leads us to want to do something to change this situation. 
And for me, particularly, I think it's important to see famine in the context of not being inevitable. What happened in Ireland in the 1840s was not inevitable. Famine in the world today is not inevitable. It happens as a result of political decisions. And again, I think we as conscious citizens need to play an active part in making sure that people are not hungry, that people do not suffer famine. And so when I think of these issues, I really think of 1845, when the blight came to Ireland, but so did the great human rights activist, Frederick Douglass. And his legacy has continued with people from John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and more recently, the great late lamented John Lewis. And I was very honored that John Lewis visited Ireland in 2014. I was part of a group that traveled with him. And I remember his saying about, if you see a wrong, stand up to it, make good trouble. And I think that's great advice for us today. Make good trouble. Hunger and famine do not have to happen. The American Civil War was the next stop on the Irish immigrant journey. Immigration due to the Great Famine, 1845 to 1852, had provided many thousands of potential recruits for that war. The Civil War strengthened the parade because so many Irish soldiers defended the Union. A new attitude toward the Irish emerged that was much more sympathetic. Irish American Catholics served on both sides of the Civil War as officers, volunteers, and draftees. Abraham Lincoln greatly respected his Irish recruits. In the run-up to the Civil War, the late 1850s, New York is one tough town. There is the elite side of New York, the, the Protestant blue bloods who run the city, and there is the growing immigrant population of Irishmen and Germans. And by the time of the Civil War, um, there is a dominance in democratic politics by the Irish American vote. Um, Tammany Hall and other organizations spring up to organize new immigrants who only had to wait five years for the right to vote in those days. And they became a formidable force. In the election of 1860, which is of course the election that decides on the course of the future of the Union and slavery, um, I guess it would be nice to recollect that the Irish rallied behind Abraham Lincoln but he was the candidate of the Republican party. And that party tended to attract the German American vote, the refugees from the revolutions of uh, the 1840s who were committed anti-slavery men. The Irish vote remained loyal to the Democratic party. And in the 1860 election, Lincoln wins only one third of the vote in New York City and no more than a third in the independent city of Brooklyn. That sets the stage for his arrival in New York in February 1861 en route to Washington for his inauguration. Seven states had already seceded from the Union by the time Lincoln reaches New York. And the poet Walt Whitman watches as Lincoln arrives at his hotel, the Astor House opposite City Hall on Lower Broadway, and remembers the sound of deafening silence as he's greeted. So we know that on the eve of war, not only is the United States divided, but the city of New York is divided as well. In April of 1861, the Confederacy opens fire on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. And in the next 48 hours, Abraham Lincoln asks for 75,000 volunteers to fight what has now become an armed rebellion against the United States. New York responds. The Irish population of New York responds. Let's never forget that the 69th Regiment, uh, what later became known as the Fighting Irish, is formed, equipped, and heads off to war in the first few weeks after Fort Sumter falls to the Confederacy. 
They, they rush off to war, well-organized. They're originally um, it, organized into a unit that is dominated by Yankee Protestant uh, uh, regiments. But the 69th soon earns its own distinction. And in the Battle of Bull Run, the first big encounter of the Civil War, the Fighting 69th earns that nickname that it would carry not only for the rest of the Civil War, but for the rest of military history in the United States. A very tough, a very resilient unit, which is why after that, that terrible defeat for the Union, the Fighting 69th emerges with more glory than just about any unit in the Union Army. In the collections of the New York Historical Society is a huge painting by Louis Lang, uh, The Return of the 69th from the Seat of War. Uh, it shows a, an officer on horseback doffing his cap uh, with a huge crowd uh, at the, uh, in Lower Manhattan at the Battery, welcoming him, doffing their caps, throwing things in the air, men, women, American flags. And uh, the man in the middle um, is uh, Thomas Marr, returning from the Battle of Bull Run. Now to see this painting, the size of it, the scale of it, you would have thought that the battle that they were returning from had been an enormous triumph. It's like a Napoleonic painting. But in fact, it was the disaster at Bull Run but the 69th had done well enough. Um, and by the way, uh, had lost its commander. Michael Corcoran was injured in that battle. Um, and so uh, Thomas Marr took over the 69th and it is he who is seen um, returning to the cheers of the crowds. One of the uh, most amazing things in this gigantic painting, which you can stare at for for quite a while to look at all the details and it's really worth the close examination. In the lower right-hand section, there is a picture of a newsboy hawking portraits for home display. And the man in the portrait is Corcoran. So Corcoran, even though he is in a Confederate prison hospital at this point, is still celebrated and honored in the picture. By the way, a word about uh, Corcoran. Um, he is eventually exchanged in an early prisoner exchange with Confederate wounded. He is shipped back across Union lines to safety and he gets the ultimate honor. He gets a visit from Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States who shakes his hand and thanks him for his valor. So, the 69th is honored not just in legend and myth and lore, but was honored at the time by the commander in chief. He may have lost the battle, but he knew that with uh, officers like Corcoran and Marr and units like the 69th, that he was likely to win the war. In July of 1863, most Northern communities are celebrating the Union victory at Gettysburg. But here in New York, and we all know what New York summers are like, uh, the city is kind of overheated for a different reason. And that's because the military draft, the first in American history is about to commence. Um, it uh, is accompanied by a great deal of argument in the newspapers. The Republican papers praise military, uh, cons military conscription. The Democratic papers oppose it. And they warn their readers that this will be a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. Why? Because those with enough money can pay $300 to buy an exemption, technically a substitute to fight for him during the war. New York's uh, working class Irish are fed these incendiary interpretations by newspapers like the New York World, the New York Herald, which warn them, not only are they going to die for the Republicans, but that they're now going to die for newly freed African Americans, who, by the way, they warn, will soon be free enough to come to New York and compete for the unskilled jobs that pay so little, but that you now need for survival. So enough people were inflamed, enough people were upset 
that when the first names are pulled from a draft wheel filled with a thousand names on the corner of First Avenue and 47th Street, someone throws a rock and breaks a window. Um, the draft office is then burned down. A mob forms and gets bigger and bigger, storms uptown, crosses 59th Street and then heads down the west side, throwing rocks, looting, um, destroying property, going after Republicans and abolitionists at their homes if they know the addresses, going after mixed race couples, uh, white prostitutes who cater to black men, and ultimately randomly attacking innocent blacks, lynching some, driving some over the wharves on the west side and into the Hudson River. Ultimately, the worst act of all, the burning of the so-called Colored Orphans Asylum on Fifth Avenue and 43rd Street next to what is now the, the Century Club. Um, it would be wrong to say that this was an Irish riot. Uh, it was a democratic riot. It was a, work, a white working people's riot. And yes, many, many hundreds of Irish men and women involved in what amounted to the worst dis civil disturbance in the history of the United States, save for the Civil War itself. An unsung hero of the draft riots was Archbishop Hughes of New York, the first Catholic Archbishop of, of New York City, who tried his hardest to tone down uh, and tamp down the violence. And who knows, he might have succeeded in preventing it from being even worse than it was. But he appeared outside the old St. Patrick's, begged for quiet. He worked with the Protestant um, uh, church leaders of New York to do everything he could to hold down the violence and to request accountability. He acquitted himself so well that he fell um, into the good graces of Abraham Lincoln, who um, then enlisted the archbishop to do some diplomatic work for the Union. Uh, this was an extraordinary thing in the United States. Um, Abraham Lincoln um, had emerged from a political party built on the ashes of the anti-Catholic know-nothing movement. And now, 15 years later, the president of the United States was enlisting a prince of the church from New York to act in behalf of the Union. But Archbishop Hughes was, uh, was that kind of patriot that he uh, became a groundbreaking figure in the relationship between religious leaders and political leaders in the Civil War. On the first day of January, 1892, they opened Ellis Island and they left the people through. And the first to cross the threshold of that Isle of Hope and Tears was Annie Moore from Ireland, who was all of 15 years. Isle of Hope, Isle of Tears, Isle of Freedom, Isle of Fears, but it's not the Isle you left behind that Isle of Hunger, Isle of Pain, Isle you'll never see again. But the Isle of Home is always on your mind. Unlike immigrants from other countries, thousands of Irish women and girls traveled alone to America. During the Ellis Island era, roughly 1890 to 1924, Watson House, known as home of the Irish immigrant girls at 7 State Street, provided a safe haven for more than 100,000 young Irish girls who arrived in New York. If there were no family members to greet them, the girls went straight to the mission. The mission assisted all immigrant girls without discrimination providing help in locating relatives, finding temporary lodging, and even jobs. Charlotte Grace O'Brien founded the Home for Women and Girls. She was an Irish author and philanthropist who was an activist in nationalist causes and the protection of female immigrants. Her father was William Smith O'Brien, 
who had been a leader of the Young Ireland movement. He was convicted of sedition for his part in the Young Irelander Rebellion of 1848, but his death sentence was commuted to deportation to Van Diemen's Land, Australia. So Sean McGrace's big accomplishment or big, or big contribution really to immigrant Irish women was the, the founding, her idea to found a place, a mission, what became the mission of Our Lady the Rosary for the protection of Irish immigrant girls, which looked after more than 100,000 girls uh, who immigrated to the United States. Um, there was no interest, by the way, when she went to New York in 1882, there wasn't the least bit of interest on the part of Cardinal McCluskey in those Irish girls coming in. Now remember, first, the Irish girls would come in, New York, New York State um, established an immigrant depot at Castle Garden. Now, if you go to the Statue of Liberty, you buy your ticket at Castle Garden there. Uh, and at, at the time, uh, it was connected with New York by a kind of a walkway. So the state ran the immigration between 1855 and 1900 when the federal government said, wait a minute, this is really our job. And then they established, of course, their depot at Ellis Island. But uh, Charlotte Grace, when she came in 1882, it was under state jurisdiction. Over 100,000 girls went through the mission and we've digitized the records for about 60,000, which are available on our Irish mission at watsonhouse.org website. We had them at the mission, and then we had, of course, Hurricane Sandy, which did such damage, and we thought that the uh, records should be in a proper archival uh, location. And so the mission records, the, the physical records themselves, are now in the Archdiocesan Archives where they are in proper uh, condition, proper archival condition and protected. And of course they are under the, uh, the supervision of Kay Fagan, who is this wonderful uh, archdiocesan archivist. The Irish women who were mainly working in service, not only were they sending money home and bringing their uh, siblings and, uh, and cousins and nieces and nephews to America, but they were also working in New York. They were working for Irish American organizations. In fact, a lot of them working in service had a night off, which was the night that, that the, for example, the sodality would be. And so they, they say about the Irish girls that they built the churches. They built the churches in New York. Uh, there's a probably possibly an apocryphal story uh, that they were the, the, uh, the money behind uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, they were also involved in Irish American organizations like the Land League, the, uh, the county societies. They were involved in the nationalist movement. And so they were very much a, a part of things. But because they valued education, because they made sure that their sons and daughters had education uh, and primary education and indeed secondary education, they really helped the city move into the middle class. The Irish women, of course, were instrumental in helping the St. Patrick's Day Parade move along. The, uh, the church had, was a, a great supporter and the parishes, local parishes, had all kinds of special uh, events to support the mission of Our Lady of the Rosary. And in Quid, the Irish women were very much part of the uh, county societies and Irish cultural societies. And so when they began to be involved in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, they marched proudly with their counties, with their uh, um, associations like the Irish Teachers Association and so forth. Uh, in addition to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, uh, I'm very happy to report that the American Irish Teachers Association, who marched, uh, who marched uh, in the parade every year, uh, they were the people that were instrumental in getting the state to uh, uh, require a, a uh, curriculum 
that included the Irish Great Irish Hunger. And we did that in 1999, 1997 rather, the Great Irish Hunger Curriculum. And as a result of that, they asked me to be involved in the Irish Famine Memorial, uh, which I am asked it be called the Irish Hunger Memorial because our, our curriculum uh, on the Great Irish Famine was really a curriculum about hunger and homelessness, which is of course part of the Irish experience, but it also opens the Irish experience to other people being able to uh, identify with the same kinds of situations. The Irish Hunger Memorial uh, speaks to hunger and homelessness in the world uh, at large. And so we were very careful to make about 60% about are Irish, about 40% are non-Irish, and we have quotes in various languages other than English or the Irish language. Um, I remember when we were doing um, uh, the quote from Mary McAleese, her staff gave me this long quote, and I said, oh, it can't be that long, and I, we picked a, a perfect place for it. And so I think the quote that she finally settled on uh, is a, a, a wonderful way to look at the Hunger Memorial and to think of its international dimension. And it is Mary McAleese saying, we live in one another's shadow. And we do live in one another's shadow. And so I want to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day and let's live in each other's shadow and make the world a place for all of us. The 1920s were the golden age of New York City politics and Tammany Hall. It was the coming of age of a new generation of Irish American politicians who were eager to write laws and regulations to help working people like them to thrive in New York City. These Irish Americans were very American. They were at least a generation removed from the immigrant experience and in some cases, even more so. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Democratic Party was bitterly split between its urban machines, representing Catholics and Jews, iron workers and seamstresses, from the tenements of the Northeast and Midwest, and its populists and patricians, who enforced long-held cultural, political, and religious norms. The two factions seemed to have no common ground, but just before the Roaring Twenties, Al Smith, a proud son of the Tammany Hall political machine, and Franklin Roosevelt, a country squire, formed an unlikely alliance that transformed the Democratic Party. Both ran for president. The 1920s in New York were the golden age for Tammany Hall, and it marked a real coming of age of Irish America in the sense that they had been here for a while. It had been some time since the famine immigration and then the immigration of the 1880s, but now the Irish were coming into power, real power. And sort of the exemplar of that was Al Smith, who was the grandson of an Irish immigrant and who uh, was the governor of New York through most of the period of the 1920s. And he was very much a symbol of this new, confident Irish America. But the interesting thing is, most of these Irish American politicians really didn't think that much about Ireland. For example, Al Smith, who again, the symbol of Irish American political success, really never said a word about Ireland, even as Ireland was fighting for its independence. You know, the, the war in Ireland was something they didn't really see as part of their political agenda. I mean, may, perhaps privately they were following it in the Irish newspapers, which were, you know, limitless at the time as well. But for the most part, they stuck to American issues. And, you know, Al Smith was very much an assimilated Irish American. And, and so was Jimmy Walker. And so was Ed Flynn, who was the boss of the Bronx from the 1920s all the way to the early 1950s. You know, they were concerned about getting real benefits from their power to their communities. 
So you start seeing things, uh, reforms that are intended for the American working class in New York, not just the Irish, because one of the other interesting things about Irish American politicians in New York in the 20s is they can't hold power by themselves. So they reach out particularly to New York's Jewish community. And it made total sense because the Jewish community was growing in the 1920s, just as the Irish American community had been growing in the 19th century. And uh, there was a similarity in their attitudes towards government uh, and progressive change. Uh, so what you see uh, through the Irish American leadership in the 1920s, you see a growth of Jewish power in New York. You're seeing Jewish politicians endorsed by Tammany Hall becoming deputy speaker and uh, all sorts of honorifics uh, that were granted uh, by the Irish and Tammany who were very shrewd and realized uh, there was a certain commonality of interest, but there was also the perspective of power, right? Once the Irish got power, they weren't about to just sort of fritter it away. They wanted to build coalitions uh, and so you see not just this coalition uh, with the, the Jews of New York, uh, but in fact, uh, Tammany Hall in the 1920s promoted arguably one of the most powerful African-Americans in New York, maybe even in the East Coast, a guy by the name of Ferdinand Morton, who was the head of the Civil Service Commission in New York in, New York in the 1920s. He was black. Uh, that was a very controversial appointment, uh, particularly among Democrats in the South, who pointed to Tammany Hall and said, oh, you see what they're doing? They're advancing Jews and they're advancing Blacks, and we don't want any part of that. And that conflict actually came to a head in New York in 1924 at the Democratic National Convention, uh, where Al Smith hoped to be nominated for president. He was denied, uh, and he was denied in part uh, because of his inclusive nature. And he kind of got his revenge in 1928 when he became the first Catholic uh, to be nominated for president of the United States. You know, Franklin Roosevelt was a very shrewd politician. I mean, I suppose that goes without saying, but one of the ways he displayed how shrewd he was is he, uh, he understood the power of Irish America. I mean, he came from New York after all. He may have lived in Hyde Park, but he was a New Yorker, right? So he filled his administration with Irish Catholics. In fact, uh, in a very politically incorrect moment, Eleanor Roosevelt once complained <laughs> that, that her husband seemed to always be surrounded by Catholics. She wasn't able to delete that tweet, uh, so it's there for us to see, uh, but she wasn't wrong. Uh, Irish Catholics uh, tended to support Franklin Roosevelt. In fact, they were among the most supportive of, of any voting group. And he rewarded them. Uh, the chairman of the National Democratic National Committee was a guy named James Farley, who is a, an Irish American from Rockland County. And frankly, we don't have enough time to go into all of the people, all of the Irish Catholics who uh, were promoted to prominent positions under uh, the Roosevelt administration. Uh, I once thought of, uh, well, you know, Tony, the famous uh, writer, Tony Ra uh, Morrison uh, once said that Bill Clinton was sort of the first black president because he, he had a, uh, you know, he was able to relate to uh, African-Americans in a way uh, that they understood. And I thought, well, by the same reasoning, you, Franklin Roosevelt may have been the first Irish Catholic president because he understood Irish America and he understood Irish America because he understood and dealt with Al Smith and Charlie Murphy and all those great New York Irish of the 1920s. So there was a great mainstreaming of Irish America and Irish American power during the Roosevelt administration. And as you know, the, obviously Irish America suffered as much as any group during the depression, uh, during the war, World War I uh, and the prosperity that followed World War I, Irish America, you know, is, is now getting economic power that it had never had before. And, and of course, you know, the 1950s were a time uh, where America was great. If you were not 
African American or a member of uh, other minority groups, uh, but Irish America suddenly is now uh, sort of thrust into uh, economic power in ways that it had never been before. Uh, as a result, uh, some people would say, uh, Irish America began to deviate from its embrace of the Democratic Party uh, beginning in the 1950s. You have political scientists who are far smarter than I, which is all of them, uh, saw that trend of what we later called a Reagan Democrat sort of began in the 50s. You know, Irish Americans were moving out of the old neighborhoods in New York. They were going to Long Island. They were going to uh, Rockland, Westchester County. They owned homes and they you know, became more established and therefore uh, more conservative. So as John Kennedy is beginning to think about running for president, uh, and of course, obviously does in 1960, the Irish America that he is going to appeal to is more politically powerful th than it had been, and certainly more economically powerful than it had ever been. And, you know, that's the dynamic that he's going to have to deal with as the symbol, you know, the ultimate symbol of Irish American political success, but also, let's remember, economic success. And the Kennedy's Kennedy's had a dollar or two to spare. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith and a strong uh, desire for liberty. And I'm glad to say, and I'm glad to say that all of his great grandchildren have valued that inheritance. Yeah, yeah. If he hadn't left, I'd be working over at the Albatross Company. <laughs> Or perhaps for John D. Kelly. <laughs> in, in any case, we are happy uh, to be back here. About uh, 50 uh, years ago, an Irishman from New Ross uh, traveled down to Washington with his family. And in order to tell his neighbors how well he was doing, he had his picture taken in front of the White House and said, uh, this is our summer home. Uh, uh, come and see us. Well. It's our home also in the winter, and I hope you will come and see us. Thank you. John Fitzgerald Kennedy served as the 35th President of the United States from 1961 until his assassination in 1963. Kennedy was President at the height of the Cold War, and during his brief term, his efforts were largely focused on relations with the Soviet Union and Cuba. A Democrat, Kennedy was the first Irish Catholic president. He had represented Massachusetts in both houses of the U.S. Congress before his defeat of Richard Nixon in the presidential election of 1960. JFK was born outside Boston in Brookline, Massachusetts on May 29, 1917 to Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., a businessman and politician, and Rose Kennedy. His paternal grandfather, P.J. Kennedy, had served as a Massachusetts state legislator. His maternal grandfather and namesake, John F. Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, served as a U.S. congressman and was elected to two terms as mayor of Boston. All four of JFK's grandparents were children of Irish immigrants. In his inaugural address, President Kennedy spoke of the need for all Americans to be active citizens famously saying, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. He invited the nations of the world to join together to fight what he called the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. The age of Camelot had begun. JFK enjoyed his first St. Patrick's Day in the White House on March 17th, 1961, and proudly accepted at the White House 
the presentation of shamrocks, the symbol of Ireland. In 1958, when Aer Lingus began transatlantic flights between Ireland and the U.S., fresh shamrock sprigs from Ireland were presented to the White House. The tradition continues to this day. There's a magical, almost fairy tale quality in looking back and remembering 1960, particularly the race for the White House that year. For many, it was as though America was turning a page, beginning a new chapter in her history. Theodore H. White captured that moment better than anyone when he concluded the first chapter of The Making of the President 1960 with these words about John Kennedy. Quote, he had somehow stirred every nerve end of the American political system, and that system would never be the same. But neither would America. Significant as 1960 was and is, John Kennedy, the first president born in the 20th century and at 43, the youngest ever elected, the first Catholic to occupy the White House, and the first and only president to be the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize. Let me suggest that 1961, and 1962 also deserve recognition in the annals of Irish American history. It wasn't until Kennedy's inauguration on that cold January the 20th, 1961, that the new president could assert that the torch of leadership now belonged to a new generation. But executive branch authority was just one dimension of this power shift. Up on Capitol Hill, Mike Mansfield, the son of two Irish immigrants, was sworn in as Senate Majority Leader 17 days before JFK. And one year later, in January of 1962, John McCormick, described by one observer as, quote, the very model of the cigar chewing big city Irish politician, was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. In one year's time, the highest executive office and the two most important leadership positions in the Congress were occupied by Irish Americans, and in each case, they were the first Catholics ever to hold those offices. Throughout 1962 and until that fateful day in Dallas on November the 22nd, 1963, this was the trinity of Washington power, with Mansfield continuing as Senate Majority Leader for a record 16 years and McCormick serving for nine years as Speaker. Remarkably, each lawmaker had a strong connection to the young president. JFK was directly responsible for Mansfield moving up from Senate whip to leader when Lyndon Johnson became his running mate and then vice president. As John Kennedy told an aide at the 1960 convention, quote, if we win, it will be by a small margin and I won't be able to live with Lyndon Johnson as the leader of a small majority in the Senate. Did it occur to you that if Lyndon becomes the vice president, I'll have Mike Mansfield as the leader in the Senate, somebody I can trust and depend on? 
McCormick was a Bostonian, just like JFK. And he represented a Massachusetts House district for 43 years. He was Kennedy's own choice to be his convention floor manager in 1960. And in that role, critical in Johnson's acceptance of the number two spot on the ticket. This trio of public figures helped give the 1960s their meaning as a decade with the goal of making America a more democratic and a more equal society. They also opened doors for their successors. In the case of the Speaker of the House, six Catholics, a majority Irish Americans, have followed McCormick. John Kennedy was at the head of the parade that brought Irish Americans into the mainstream of our national life. But he wasn't alone. Mike Mansfield and John McCormick were right behind him, contributing daily to the march of American history in this very consequential time. John Kennedy's torch of leadership has been passed to a number of presidents since the 1960s, but none more than Joe Biden embodies what John Kennedy had in mind in terms of leadership and taking America forward. He is someone who represents the connection to the early 1960s and what John Kennedy really embodied in his uh, own role as president. In Joe Biden's case in 1987, he sought the presidency. Why? To be the second John Kennedy. He was unable to be successful that year. He was unable to be successful in 2008. But in 2020, he found his voice and he found the torch of leadership. And now as president, he is able to light the way and particularly to light the way between the United States and Ireland at this very critical time. New York City had vastly changed for the Irish by the 1980s. Most of the Irish had moved to the suburbs and there were few Irish-born politicians to be found around City Hall. The parade took on a more organized committee to manage the intricacies of what was to become a major public and media spectacle. Meanwhile, in Ireland, the 1980s was a challenging decade politically and economically. High unemployment led to substantial immigration and a rise in undocumented Irish living in the U.S. In 1984, the Taoiseach, Dr. Garrett Fitzgerald, addressed the U.S. Congress on the topics of Northern Ireland and Anglo-Irish relations. The signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985 between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland was a major milestone in the Northern Ireland peace process. John Hume rose from the riot-torn streets of Northern Ireland would become a major player in that process. Hume worked with American Presidents Carter and Reagan and the United States Congress to lay the groundwork for U.S. support for peace in Northern Ireland. He would prove to be the hero needed on both sides of the Atlantic. Born into a background of injustice and division, John Hume was a decisive leader of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland in 1968. First, he was real. And secondly, he didn't seem to have an agenda other than the one he was pursuing. He wanted an inclusive peace. And he thought that nonviolence was the best way to pursue it. He was the Irish conflict's Martin Luther King. John Hume resolutely pursued a peaceful path throughout the Northern Irish conflict. 
Before we even got there, you opened fire. This is the story of how John Hume harnessed the political influence of the Irish-American diaspora to address that legacy of division and to achieve peace. I think he understood language to be part of the problem. The ability to speak the language of the American politic better than them is a plus. Tip took his lead of what John was saying. I would say in those days Tip was taking it far more from John than he was from the Irish government, quite frankly. The State Department was not in favor of what I did, as you may know, uh, but I didn't really consult with them too thoroughly. There was some broken China there. There were, you know, I had a lot of trouble with the British for a brief period, but I trusted his instincts. But then you had the American influence, which was a very strange thing for British politics. It wasn't just the risk of alienating the British. It was also the risk that I would stick my neck out and IRA violence would continue and I would look like I'd been played for a fool. Now, I am standing here and telling the government that I believe that we have a real process of lasting peace and a total cessation of violence. Hurry up and deal with it. He grabbed me by the wrists and held my hands and said, look, you can do it, you're near it. In 1998, the Good Friday Agreement was signed and roundly endorsed in referenda on both sides of the Irish border, and the Northern Irish Troubles ended. Hume's strategy had become a political reality. John Hume, you may know of as a leader for peace, a very prominent member of the negotiating team that led to the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And he's the subject of a film and a book I've written called John Hume in America. The film is now screening this month in, on PBS. And he's also recently passed on last August. So it's a time when we reflect on his legacy, on his contribution. Absolutely key to his contribution, as my film and book argue, was his involvement with the United States. I know that you've just heard about the tremendous legacy of the JFK presidency. And of course, the first Catholic and the first Irish Catholic to be elected the highest office in the United States. And his brother's legacy is also important. But the particular brother that I'll focus in on here in, in my short talk is Senator Ted Kennedy and his relationship with John Hume. Because he, Speaker Tip O'Neill, formed an alliance with this man, John Hume. They saw what was happening in Northern Ireland. Trouble erupted in the streets late 1960s. They saw the tragedy of the experience of people, particularly the Catholic minority there, and as senior politicians in the United States, Tip O'Neill at that time was majority leader in the House. Ted Kennedy was already US Senator. They decided they wanted to work with John Hume in a very new way. And again, I'm gonna contrast this a little with the JFK period, when there was this enormous surge of emotion that somebody like JFK could be elected as president of the United States. But given the gravity of the situation in Northern Ireland, it was clear to such politicians as Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, and they were later joined by Governor Kerry and Senator Moynihan from New York. They saw that they needed to form an alliance to ensure that the United States could engage on congressional level and ultimately at the White House level to assist with Northern Ireland, to put pressure on the United Kingdom government to be more flexible on the Irish question, to acknowledge that there was an Irish dimension to the Northern Irish identity, the people who lived there. And Hume's great role was be being a strategist, being a touchstone for these four politicians who became known famously as the, the Four Horsemen. They formed in 1977, the same year, Jimmy Carter as president of the United States, who had been elected on the platform of human rights. He saw the 
wisdom of their approach. And he issued a statement, the very first statement by any US president on Northern Ireland, stating that the United States would act as an honest broker and would provide investment to Northern Ireland if the violence could end. So it was a strictly and absolutely nonviolent approach, both by the president of the United States and these prominent politicians in the Congress. Out of this came a formidable caucus formed in 1981 called the Friends of Ireland, which is today celebrating its 40th anniversary. 1981, it was formed in the wake of the Reagan landslide. And it built on the work of the, the horsemen. It was resolutely bipartisan. And it supported in 1985, famously, with President Reagan, the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which gave the Irish government a formal role in the running of Northern Ireland for the first time. So what you have here in the 70s into the 80s is a huge legacy of United States engagement, which I would suggest leads directly into the 1990s and one of the most interventionist US presidents um, in history, of course, President Clinton. But in my film, President Clinton does acknowledge the enormous role that was played by his predecessors, both in the White House and in, in the Congress. And what enabled them to do this was John Hume's steadfast vision of a pluralist, nonviolent approach to political change in Northern Ireland. He believed, which is very much reflected in the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, that there were relationships within Northern Ireland, there was a relationship between Ireland, North and South, and then there was a relationship between Ireland and Great Britain. These relationships had to be addressed in an equitable way, in a democratic way, in a nonviolent way, to affect political change. So that's one of the key influences that the four horsemen had. They put at the highest level of US politics the strategy and the vision of John Hume. There have been many presidents of the United States who had their roots in this soil. I can see today how lucky I am to be the first president of the United States to come back to this city to say thank you very much. Hillary and I are proud to be here in the home of Ireland's most tireless champion for civil rights and its most eloquent voice of nonviolence, John Hume. I know that at least twice already I have had the honor of hosting John and Pat in Washington, and the last time I saw him, I said, you can't come back to Washington one more time until you let me come to Derry. And here I am. <laughs> With the help of the Clinton White House, the Good Friday Agreement brought peace to Northern Ireland in 1998. Former Senator George Mitchell played a leading role in the negotiations. After 15 months of a ceasefire, President Bill Clinton was the first U.S. President to visit Northern Ireland. The cities of Belfast and Derry were the sites of President Clinton's major public appearance in Northern Ireland. For his leadership in securing the Good Friday Agreement, John Hume would be a co-recipient of the 1998 Nobel Peace Prize with David Trimble, leader of the Protestant Ulster Unionist Party. Derry was also the home region of the Nobel Prize winning poet, Seamus Heaney whose vision of Irish national reconciliation seemed to have a deep influence on President Clinton's rhetoric about the Northern Ireland peace process and continues to inspire President Joe Biden. The challenges of the peace process continue today. So what was happening in America 
after the Good Friday Agreement and since a lot. Um, and I think to some degree, Northern Ireland and the peace process there, the ongoing peace process there, kind of fell off people's radar. People at the everyday level felt like that was done and dusted, that the hard work, the heavy lifting had really been done. There were others like the Friends of Ireland, George Mitchell, other figures, even George Bush. Um, so across the aisle who understood that in fact, the hardest part was implementing the peace agreement after the fact. So what you see happening is, you know, in 2001 in America, there was a great shift in focus from some of our historical geopolitical commitments and preoccupations to really a renewed concern with terrorism and in particular terrorism emanating from uh, the Middle East and other parts of the Arab or Muslim world. That really set on our radar as this is our preoccupation for now. So at a mass level, our focus shifted that way into other geopolitical concerns like the rise of China and threats from Russia. At the same time, and quite importantly, uh, many figures in the American government didn't lose sight of the fact that American energy, thoughtfulness, pressure, commitment to the peace process in Northern Ireland was something that had to continue. So that was done in various ways through funding, through the Washington and Ireland program, um, through connections that were made at governmental levels, uh, through young people, emerging leaders on both sides of the Atlantic. One indication of Americans and Irish Americans in particular, their recognition of the importance of ongoing commitment and ongoing work, ongoing thoughtfulness about the peace process in Ireland um, was the fact that George Mitchell was named the Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in 2016. So in a way that was a recognition and a recommitment to continued involvement in that peace process, which has been so incredibly important and remains potentially even more important than ever, given all of the new challenges that that peace process faces, not, not least of which is Brexit. What Brexit did was it made these divisions even sharper. It exposed all of the challenges and then intensified them. Um, so the peace process now is, I think it's right to say, more fragile than ever. There are a couple reasons for this. Firstly, what it's done is it's raised the question of the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and the UK. It's raised that, it's brought that back into question. And it's made people on the ground there think about, as it has for us, think about the relationship between Northern Ireland and Ireland itself. So it's exposed people's national aspirations and brought that back onto the table as a conversation that was kind of kicked down the road um, with the Good Friday Agreement. And then secondly, what it's done is it's put a great strain on the relationship between Ireland and the UK those governments to the extent that it's made their roles as co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement a bit compromised. So thankfully, uh, there are still people, including Friends of Ireland, um, and now uh, the Biden administration that make a new engagement possible, a new engagement on the part of Americans uh, a way for Irish Americans to channel their energies and their resources into supporting the peace in, in Ireland. 
This can be done in a number of different ways and already has started. So for instance, Congressman Richie Neal made it clear to the British government that the US wouldn't be approving any trade deal that violated or threatened the Good Friday Agreement. Even just that public statement had a much greater impact than perhaps people would have expected. So there's still a huge role for Americans, uh, the American government to play in being supportive of the peace in Northern Ireland. The Biden administration can renew a sense of hope, engage people in a sense of security at a time when, because of the chaos and the contention surrounding Brexit, um, peace there feels more unstable than perhaps it ever has um, in the past. So the Biden administration, Americans in general can help to renew relationships and help to create a sense of commitment and support um, that it sounds trivial, but is in fact quite vital for the continuation of the peace process on the island of Ireland. At the onset of the new millennium, the Irish American community suffered significant losses on 9-11. 2,606 died in the World Trade Center and in the surrounding area. Among them, 343 members of the New York City Fire Department and the 23 members of the NYPD who died in the line of duty. Hundreds of Irish American individuals working in the financial and insurance companies within the towers died that day. The following year, 2002, a parade of honor in their memory was a moving feature of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. The Parade of Honor was led by Grand Marshal Cardinal Edward Egan, the head of the Archdiocese of New York, who had officiated at many of those funerals that year. The parade stopped for a planned moment of silence at 12.30 p.m., some 90 minutes after it had begun. More than 300,000 participants in a show of respect, heads bowed, faced Lower Manhattan, where the Trade Center once stood. In 2016, the Grand Marshal of the parade was former U.S. Senator George Mitchell of Maine, who negotiated the Northern Ireland Peace Accord. 2016 was a year of major change. The parade kicked off for the first time in its history by welcoming members of the LGBTQ community to join the lineup for the first time. The parade also celebrated the centennial of Ireland's Easter Rising in 1916 against British rule and was broadcast live for the first time in Ireland and the United Kingdom. Last year, 2020, with the onset of the pandemic, Fifth Avenue was silent. The parade was one of the first high-profile U.S. public events to be felled by the global coronavirus pandemic. This year, the parade is canceled again, although the organizers will mark the day with a symbolic parade and a virtual salute to honor first responders and essential workers for their heroic work since the start of the pandemic. This will be a new virtual milestone celebrated by future generations. On that note, we wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day and end our program with a musical tribute to all first responders and essential workers by a special group of Irish musicians, Derek Warfield and the Young Wolf Tones. Their song, The Streets of New York, written by Irish singer Liam Riley, is the anthem of New York's first responders of Irish heritage. I was 18 years old when I went down to Dublin with a fistful of money and a cartload of dreams. Take your time, said me father, stop rushing like hell and remember all is not what it seems to be. 
Remember there's fellas what caught you for the coat on your back Or the watch that you got from your mother So take care, me young bucko, and mind yourself well Will you give this sweet note to me, brother? At the time, Uncle Benji was a policeman in Brooklyn Me father, the youngest, he looked after the farm When a phone call from America said, send a lad over Me old fella said, sure it wouldn't do any harm For I've spent my life working this dirty old ground For a few pints of porter and the smell of the pound Sure, maybe there's something you'll learn or you'll see And you can bring it back home, make it easy on me So I landed at Kennedy when a big yellow taxi Carried me and me bags through the streets and the rain Well, me poor heart was thumping around with excitement And I hardly even heard what the driver was saying We came in the short park way through the flatlands of Brooklyn To my uncle's apartment on East 53rd I was feeling so happy, I was humming a song And I sang, you're as free as a bird Well, to shorten the story, what I found out that day Uncle Benji got shut down in an uptown foray And while I was flying my way to New York Poor Benji was lying in a cold city morgue So I phoned up the old fella and told him the news I could tell he could hardly stand up in his shoes And he wept as he told me, go ahead with the plan And not to forget, be a proud Irish man So I went all to Nelly's beside Fordham Road Started to learn about lifting the load But the heaviest thing that I carried that year Was the bittersweet thoughts of my hometown so dear I went home that December Cause me old fella died And to borrow the money from Phil on the side And sure all the bright flowers and grass couldn't hide The poor wasted face of my father I sold up the old farmyard for what it was worth And into my bag stuck a handful of earth And I boarded a plane And I caught me a train And I found myself back in the US again It's been 22 years since I set foot in Dublin The kids know to use the correct knife and fork But I'll never forget the green grass and the rivers As I keep law and order on the streets of New York 